Hello, everybody. Welcome to Poetry Day 11. Today we're going to read Scranimals by Jack Perlutsky, pictures by Peter Sis, and at the end you are going to write an animal, Scranimal, that will become part of the islands uh, group. So let's dive in. Here we go. We're sailing to Scranimal Island. It doesn't appear on most maps. The paratotters float on the tide there. The stormy petrophelon, uh, the petrelephant flaps. We may find a rare ostrichita. There's never been one in a zoo. We're sailing to Scranimal Island. You're welcome to come too. And so here we go. We've got our little sailing skateboard and an umbrella and our life preserver. Okay, we're about to set off on this wonderful adventure. Oh, beautiful rhinoceros. So captivating, head to toes. So aromatic, toes to head. Enchantress of the flower bed. Your blossoms cheer us every morn. And we adore your tail and horn. You soothe the eyes and delight the nose. Most glorious rhinoceros. So you can see we've got the rhinoceros and a rose put together. The rhinoceros. So you can see how the poem is written about characteristics of a rhinoceros and characteristics of a rose. For example, so aromatic, that's the smell, toes to head, right? So the smell of a rose from its base all the way to the, the flower petals, um, that describes the rose. The enchantress of the flower bed, right? A rose is enchanting. It's so beautiful. Your blossoms cheer us every morning, right? Every morn. <clears throat> we adore your tail and your horn. So there, uh, the rhinoceros has a wonderful tail and horn, right? But roses also uh, have thorns on them. So that kind of goes with both, which is nice. You soothe the eyes and delight the nose. Most glorious rhinoceros. Okay, so when you're writing your poem today, you want to make sure you're including characteristics of the animal and um, either the plant or some of the scranimals here have food. Okay, so you want to have those attached. Also, in your poem, you want to uh, write down how to pronounce your mashup word. <clears throat> so this is rye dash nos dash er dash o's. Rhinoceros, so the reader knows how to pronounce it correctly. So next we have spinach chickens. A clutch of spinach chickens is fussing in the yard. They peck their meager pickings. Their lives are dull and hard. Except for paltry feathers, they're mostly leafy green. Their heads are smooth as leather. Their brains are not too keen. Some say that they're distasteful, while others think they're sweet. They're never very graceful. They wilt at signs of heat. They mill about all morning upon their scrawny legs, then cluck a single warning and lay their turquoise eggs. Wonderful. This is a cam Camelberta peaches. It's like a camel and a peach match up here. Here we have the potatoed. Well, here is Mr. Potatoed. Let's see if I can hold this up. Okay. There you go. On a bump beside a road sits a lowly potatoed, obviously unaware 
of its own existence there. On its coarse and warty hide, it has eyes on every side. Eyes that fail, apparently, to take note of what they see. It does not move. It does not think. It does not eat. It does not drink. It does not hear or taste or touch. The potatoed does not do much. The day is hot on the ground. The day is hot. The ground is parched. And yet it sits as if it's starched. To pose immobile by a road suffices for the potatoed. And then here is the way it's supposed to be pronounced. Potatoed. So this guy is content just sitting by the road, doesn't do much at all. Love it. <clears throat> Next we have the Cardinal Albacore. And I like to read it sometimes before I say it. Cardinal Albacore. Cardinal Albacore. Okay. Has to do maybe with the rhythm uh, of the verse. <clears throat> The cardinal, the cardinal albacore, one more time. The cardinal albacore has a face entirely red. Its busy wings are sore from holding up its head. It hovers on the brink. Its existence isn't fair. Its tail flops in the drink, but its top stays in the air. It simply cannot let its own bottom pull down, pull it down. If it got entirely wet, it would definitely drown. Yet, the Cardinal Bacor seems undaunted by the fact that its life is nothing more than a full-time circus act. So, Cardinal and the Albacore tuna? All right. <laughs> Excellent. These are... Hippopotam mushrooms. Hippopotam mushrooms. The hippopotam mushrooms cannot wander very far. How fortunate they're satisfied precisely where they are. They feel no need to travel. They're forever at their ease, relaxing on the forest floor beneath the shady trees. The hippopotam mushrooms suffer from deficient grace and their tubby, blobby bodies tend to take up too much space, but they compensate with manners for the things they lack in style. They are models of politeness, and they always wear a smile. <laughs> Wonderful. Let's continue on. The parrot otters lie on their backs in the sea, calling to cormorants, yapping at ox. They cannot stop prattling, through most, though most would agree that no one pays heed when a parrot otter talks. This is the porcupine apple. <clears throat> Sweet porna uh, pine apple. Sorry, this, see, I should read the word. Porcupine apple. Okay. Porcupine apple. Sweet porn. <laughs> Sweet porcupine apple. Unflappable chap. You happily amble all over the map. Sharp. Prickles protect your subtropical hide. Not many could chew you. Not many have tried. Your spirits are high and your worries are few. You go where you go and you do what you do. A pointed example of perfect design. Sweet porcupine apple. Your life is divine. The porcupine apple. That's a good mashup. Both of those are pretty spiny. And now we have 
the Bracca Lions, and Antilopetunia. The Antilopetunia. Oh, I think it's an Antilope Petunia. So the Antelope Petunia and the Bracca Lions. Oh, this isn't looking good for this Antelope Petunia. Let's see what happens. A pride of Bracca lions has assembled in the grass, paying scrupulous attention to the creatures ranging past. Then an antelope petunia moves directly into view, and the chase begins in earnest, and they all know what to do. They are beasts of regal bearing, in their coats of green and gold. They are fierce and prepossessing. They are cunning. They are bold. Soon their chosen victim stumbles, for despite its nimble gait, its pursuers overtake it and consign it to its fate. With adroitness and precision, they dispatch their fallen prey, and that antelope petunia will not bloom another day. Then that pride of Bracca lions, having hunted, having fed, growls and yawns in satisfaction and goes noisily to bed. Mm. The Petra Elephant. The Petra Elephant. The Petra Elephant. The Petra Elephant. Okay. The ponderous, stormy petrelephant is futilely trying to fly. Its efforts are clearly irrelevant. One look, and it's plain to see why. Its wings are too small to support it. They're patently only for show. And so it's, con con so, and so it's constantly thwarted. Up isn't a place it can go. It hasn't a hope of succeeding. It's destined to wander the plains, which, given its bulk and its breeding, is where we prefer it remains. The stormy petrelephant's failures relieve us of absolute dread. We love it in fields of azaleas. We'd hate if it soared overhead. Here we have the toucan enemies, the toucan ammonies, toucan ammonies. <clears throat> the lovely toucan enemies, profuse upon the hills, display their gaudy petals and their multicolored bills. They revel in the sunshine, they rejoice to feel the breeze, and every drop of rain delights the toucan ammonies. The lovely Tucanemones are quite a noisy bunch. They chatter when they waken, and continue well past lunch. If you should pet their blossoms, tantalizing to the touch, they're apt to nip your fingers, though they will not nip them much. At times the Tucanemones may flap their wings a while, as if to rise into the skies, but that is not their style. They're clearly underqualified to soar above the trees, and earthbound life's the limit for the toucan emonies. So, like the emonies are the uh, like a sea anemone that lives uh, in the water. <clears throat> Look, see the petra elephant. Oh boy. You guys know the name of this one? What do you think that could be? This is the radish shark. The radish shark. Try to get the angle here. I'll just focus on the poem right now. 
In the middle of the ocean, in the deep, deep dark, dwells a monstrous apparition that detested a radish shark. It's an underwater nightmare that you hope you will never meet, for it eats what it wants, and it always wants to eat. Its appalling, bulbous body is astonishingly red, and its fangs are sharp and gleaming in its huge and horrid head. And the only thought it harbors in its small but frightful mind is to catch you and to bite you on your belly and behind. It is ruthless. It is brutal. It swims swiftly. It swims far. So it's guaranteed to find you almost anywhere you are. If the radish shark is near you, pray the beast is fast asleep in the middle of the ocean in the dark, dark deep. Look out, the radish shark's coming. Okay. Woo! Can you guys guess what this one is? What did we find here? On Scranimal Island. This is the... Banana Conda. The Banana Conda. Banana Conda. Here we go. Oh, sleek banana conda, you longest long, long fellow, how sinuous and sly you are, how slippery, how yellow. You slither on your belly, and you slither on your chin. You're only unappealing as you shed your slinky skin. <laughs> So here we are, we have the mango and gorilla, the mangorilla, and we have the orangutan and tangerine, the orangutangerine and mangorilla. There, cavorting through the jungle in a sea of brilliant green, please observe the mangorilla and orangutangerine. They are racing, they are sparring, playing leapfrog, tag, and catch, and in every competition, they are one another's match. Now the mangorilla dances on a verdant, mossy bed, while his acrobatic playmate swings in branches overhead. We feel privileged to view them. They are rare and seldom seen, the enormous mangorilla, the orangutangerine. <clears throat> Behold the ostrich cheetah, a blur that rushes past. There is not a creature fleeter, not a creature quite as fast. It swiftly covers distance, never slackening in its pace, Throughout its whole existence, it has yet to lose a race. With fur and feathers flying, it hurtles on and then, somehow, not even trying, accelerates again. But when it tires of running, it does not simply stand. Though quick, it's far from cunning, its head goes in the sand. The Ostrachita. On a certain mountain meadow, if you're silent, if you're still, you may spy a single yellow, black and white pandaffodil. You may even hear it yawning. If the morning's just begun, watch its petals slowly open to embrace the rising sun. You may see it soon meander to a stand of tall bamboo, pluck a succulent example, and commence to chomp and chew. It may plop upon its belly, flop upon its downy back, turn an amiable cartwheel, and continue with its snack. You may see it fold its petals 
when the sun sinks overhead, and in languorous contentment trundle homeward and to bed. You may never see another gentle, shy pandaffodil, even on that mountain meadow, though you're silent, though you're still. Poor avocado does, ungainly and green, you're gone from t today's biological scene. Your cranium's held, but a bit of brain, explaining in part why you didn't remain. You never were fast, and you never were strong. It's hardly surprising you couldn't last long. A fruit and a fowl, inexplicably linked, poor avocado does. You're sadly extinct. <clears throat> We've journeyed to Scranimal Island, where magical creatures are found, where avocado does still flourish and green spinach chickens abound. We've seen a pandaffodil dining, a porcupine apple at play. Perhaps there is more to discover. We'd like to to return there some day. Seems they're just at the beach imagining Scranimal Island. I really like this image on the back here. We have uh, a uh, an orangutan plus a tangerine is an orangutan tangerine. Or a tangerine tang, <laughs> I forgot what it was. The parrot and otter, parrot otter, the ostrich and cheetah, ostrich cheetah, the potato and toad, potato, the mango and gorilla, mangorilla, the rhinoceros and rose, rhinoceros, and the radish and shark, the rad is shark, the rad is shark. So now you guys get to sail to Scranimal Island, and you're going to come up with ideas right now for a Scranimal you're going to write a poem about. So uh, I've got my example here, and first I wrote down uh, animals I could write about. So I was thinking just around our local area, we have bear, whale, eagle, salmon, uh, not too many lizards, but where I'm from in Florida, there's lots of lizards, and we've got orcas out here. Those were the animals I was thinking about. So I want you to write down all the animals you would like to maybe write a scranimal poem about. Then, you want to write down maybe some food that you could include. So I wrote down a pear, wheat straw, strawberry, apple... And as I was writing these, I was also not too much overthinking, but, you know, things that might pair well with the animals that I wrote down. Okay, things that might be able to join in the sound. Uh, but don't overthink it. Just right off the top of your head, all the fruit, food, vegetables, right, that you can think of. Go ahead and write those down. Then, you're going to take your animals and food items... And you're going to match them up. You can match two animals. You can match an animal and a fruit. Uh, and so then I have my possible mashups. I came up with a, a paralegal, which is sort of like uh, an attorney uh, with a pear and an eagle mixed together. Uh, an orca and strawberry, which was um, an orchestra berry. I was thinking of like an orchestra and a strawberry, and then the orca animal, so an orca strawberry, and an apple lizard, an apple lizard. <laughs> so uh, I had a lot of fun with this. I hope you do too. Uh, once you settle on something, then I want you to write down all the ideas and details for that thing. So I decided to write uh, a poem about an orca strawberry. So I wrote down all kind of the Words that I could think of for orchestra really, I mean orca, really quick. 
uh, family, they live in a pod, they live in a Puget Sound, Salish Sea, salmon, eating, smart, right? Uh, you could include a lot of things there. Then I said, okay, what are some characteristics about a strawberry? Sweet, red, I have, a, have them in a smoothie, heart-shaped, delicious, sometimes chocolate goes with them, okay? Uh, write down a bunch of characteristics there. And then I decided, okay, what, what ideas do I have for this mashup? So I wrote down the orchestra berry. And then I was thinking, okay, I really wanted to go with an orchestra angle here. So I wrote down some ideas about, you know, uh, characteristics of an orchestra. Large, sound, instrument, theater, conductor, percussion, woodwinds, brass. Uh, and... Then I was thinking, oh, now it's coming to me. See, all of these ideas helped lead my mind to an orca-dressed strawberry that's a conductor of singing birds and vocal animals. So now I have a theme from which to write from, okay? So now that I have kind of a central idea of what I want my poem to be about, I wrote... The orchestra berry. And you guys should include how to pronounce your word. So, orchestra berry. Okay. So, here's my poem, The Orchestra Berry. The orchestra berry creates a wondrous sound. For on special occasion, all scranimals gather round. Potatoes and rhinoceros are first to be seen playing thunderous tones on timpani. Soon radish shark and parrot otter join in, producing symphonic sounds with beak and dorsal fin. Sweet, sweet melody blankets the crowd, and all of Scranimal Island is held spellbound. There you have it, fifth graders of Catherine Blaine. I hope you have a lot of fun writing your Scranimal poem, if you want to write more than one, you're more than welcome to do it. Can't wait to read and see and hear what you've got. Bye for now.